at the age of 17, I was just entering college and usually loafing around. Well, that's what you do at the age of 17. But uh, my special guest who's here with me wasn't doing anything like that. He had won Wimbledon, the men's singles title, at the age of 17. Tennis great and a Laureus Academy member Boris Becker joins me uh, right now. Boris, thank you for joining us. Uh, when you win Wimbledon at the age of 17, then you're pretty much setting up that any interview you do later in life, that's the question you get asked. Uh, likely, but I didn't know that beforehand. And uh, you're absolutely right. I, I wasn't supposed to win Wimbledon at 17. Um, and I was, uh, it's called the innocence of youth, that you're too young to know that you're not supposed to do things. Uh, but I guess I was good enough and I, I had no, not a care in the world and I, I went uh, from match to match and ultimately I beat Kevin Curry in the final. Yes, it's called the exuberance of youth perhaps, but it was rare and it hasn't happened ever since because you have Grand Slams and every Grand Slam a tennis player covets, but Wimbledon is right up there. No, Wimbledon uh, was and is always the most prestigious tournament uh, uh, in, in our tennis world. Uh, obviously we have four Grand Slams and and each is special and each is something that changes your life. But if you see the history of tennis, Wimbledon is the big daddy of them all. And, and it was shown in Germany when I grew up. Uh, uh, so one of the reasons I always am intrigued of you know, playing well at Wimbledon and winning it because uh, I've seen it on TV. Yeah. And you know, Kevin Curran, your opponent, said that Boris may have been 17, but he had the mentality of someone who was 25. And you actually won Queens leading up to it. Not too many people took notice, but there was one South African player who said, if he plays like this, he could go on and win it. Yeah, his name was Johan Creek. Uh, I played him in the final. I was still good friends today. He said, I should have bet some money on you. I would have been a rich <laughs> man. Uh, uh, you know, the, the thing with the tennis tour is that you play week in, week out. And, and, and I was already on the tour for almost a year. So players have seen me in the locker room, have seen me in practices. They, they've seen my my persona and my my, uh, my attitude. And I think that's what Kevin meant, that I looked like a 17-year-old, but I behaved like a 25-year-old. Yes, uh, but that win also changed your life. I mean, you were 17, but overnight you became this, uh, not even a superstar, a sensation because of the magnitude of the achievement. And uh, overnight, a celebrity, everyone wanted a piece of you. I'm not sure you were legally even allowed to drink. I wasn't. <laughs> so how um, did you celebrate? <laughs> Um, I remember um, being afraid of the, the Wimbledon ball where I was supposed to dance with Martina Navratilova. Nobody told me that it was the first year where they stopped having the male and the female champion dance to one another. And I think I nipped on a glass of champagne a little bit, but I wasn't, wasn't celebrating uh, uh, you know, with, with a couple of beers, no. Uh, okay, but if you had been asked to dance, that would have been very awkward for you, you think, with the great Martina? Or you didn't know how to dance? Well, at 17, you're a little bit shy. Uh, uh, you uh, just finished uh, uh, something historical center court. I don't think you, I was in the mood of, of putting a tuxedo in and dancing with, you know, the legend uh, herself. So you probably wanted to hit some disco. I wanted to, you know, be with people of my age. Yeah. More. yeah. <laughs> Okay, I, I hope Martina's not seeing this, but you know, Martina's a pro, she's, she'll, she'll take it in the right spirit. But that started a love affair for you with Wimbledon. You came back the next year, won it as well. You ended up playing seven finals in Wimbledon. Even today, you stay somewhere near Wimbledon. You just can't get away from that pull no, of Wimbledon. SW19, no. strawberries and cream. I call it my home these days. Uh, uh, you know, I'm a member of the club. Um, you know, I've been in Wimbledon for over 30 years. I know. Uh, Wimbledon, the village, better than my hometown. Uh, uh, my first language at home with my wife and kids is English. Mm. Uh, uh, so it all makes sense, really. And it's the only village in the world where people don't ask me what the hell I'm doing here. <laughs> You're a natural there. Everyone knows you around there. But, you know, after you, uh, perhaps two other men can come forward and, and be tagged as have, have they've inherited this mantle of carrying the legacy of Wimbledon forward. As you said, they're at home at Wimbledon. One is Pete Sampras, and then there is Roger Federer. Perhaps carrying on the legacy, which was first established by Bjorn Borg, down to Boris Becker, then these two men. Oh, very much so, and they, they deserve to carry a legacy, you know. Uh, Federer now winning eight Wimbledons, uh, Sampras always seven, but they don't live there. Yeah. 
Roger lives in Switzerland and Pete in uh, California. Um, but obviously when would they walk through the grounds, uh, they get a lot of admiration and rightly so. Yeah. Uh, you know, these days a lot of talk about this fat for Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, Murray. They've won so many Grand Slams. But I was actually, you know, while I was researching for this interview, I went back to your time. Uh, it was much more competitive then because the overall number of winners on the tour when you were playing, and I, I've just got some names down, you know, uh, Lendl, Stefan Edberg, Mats Wilander, uh, Chang, Jim Correa, Agassi, Sampras. It was much more tougher because anybody could win in, in, in that grouping. Here, when you see, it's usually the same names uh, which end up winning right now. Well, that's always the argument. Obviously, we had the Fab Four because uh, Djokovic and Murray got injured. You know, it was either Federer or Nadal or Murray or Djokovic winning one of the Grand Slams, with a few exceptions over 10 or 12 years. Um, you can argue because they were so much better than the rest, or you can either argue the other way around. Yeah. You know, in my days, it was more open. You had more, grand, more multiple Grand Slam winners from various different places, uh, uh, you know, different names, different personalities. Uh, uh, you can say because maybe we weren't as good, or maybe we were, you know, it, it goes both ways. Um, you know, the fact the fact that we have we have Federer and Nadal on top of the men's game, just just speak for the excellence of these these two players of, of you know surviving over 10 for years. Uh, in my days, you had players retiring at 25 or yes. 26. Bjorn Borg, for example, yeah. he was young. McEnroe was young. Uh, so you know, every, every area had its champion. Every area had its personalities and. and it was good in the 80s and 90s, and it's amazingly now. Yeah, it's, it's interesting yeah. you mentioned that. On the flight, I was actually watching Borg and McEnroe, that yeah. movie. Uh, but one record, uh, Boris, of yours stands out. You know, many records you set uh, in your career that you had 19 wins against players who were world number one. And a lot of people at that point, of, uh, at that point said that with Boris Becker facing you, he believes he can win, irrespective if he's having a bad day or whatever. Yeah. That was something in your career which remarkable that you had 19 wins against players who were world number one. No, that was a, an interesting stat uh, to me. I, they call me a big match player, meaning if there was a final, if there was a big match uh, against the number one in the world, it's a big match. I mean, I would play better than I usually would. Um, why that is, I think a mentality, a personality, I guess, no, what it is. But um, you know, everybody has their weaknesses and has their strength, and I think that, that was my, my strength. You know, uh, since we're talking about your era and, and your strength personalities, you played back-to-back -back three finals with Stefan Edberg. You've got to mention him when you're speaking to Boris Baker. We actually interviewed him in India yesterday and we asked him about you as well because that rivalry was great. You all played three finals and three legendary finals on Wimbledon. And that the quality of those matches is what makes us remember after so many years, 30 years down. You no, know, Stefan was probably my longest arch rival. You know, for three, four years, we were battling who was number one, who was number two. It reflected in the Wimbledon in the finals that you mentioned. Uh, we played each other in the Davis Cup, and we played over 35 times against each other. And, and you know, I have nothing bad about saying. I mean, he's the nicest, the classiest guy I've ever faced on a tennis court. Uh, when we teach each other now, we sit down, we have a coffee, and we, you know, our wives know each other. Um, so it was it was an interesting time to to face somebody that you actually like. Mm. Normally, that's not the case. But has that that's changed these days? That you know you it's, can't sit down with your rival and have a cup of tea or have a cup of coffee. It's all about winning. These well, days. normally you don't do that. I I don't know how much you know when you mentioned. Uh, Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, and Murray, how much they genuinely like each other. Mm. I'm sure there's a tremendous amount of respect for each other, but whether you actually spend some private time, I mean, I'm happy to spend some private time with Stefan. Having said that, while we were playing, I think we also kept our distance because it's just what we do. It's a competitive sport, but you know, since you mentioned 35, I think a lot of people uh, think of those finals and, and Ed Buck had a better record perhaps against you in Grand Slam finals, but the overall record was 25-10 in your favor in career head-to-head -head meetings. That's as skewed as Nadal Federer. You had the measure of him. Yeah, I, you know, you mentioned the three Wimbledon finals. He beat me twice. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, the Grand Slam, uh, the, the, the Davis Cup matches mm -hmm. that have beaten him. You know, it, he was one. And if you won, you're obviously a very, very good tennis player. And then I was behind. Sometimes I was one, then he was behind. Look, I mean, we've had, we've had an unbelievable career and, and we, you know, wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, which, which were the players you liked facing, you know, when you were playing, you know, and you felt that each time you went to play, 
you like playing that person because he brought the best out in you. Was it Stefan or was somebody well, else? Well, liking is a is a big word. I mean, I I, I don't mind the challenge and I don't mind the the uh, excitement of, of facing Edberg and Lendl and Zampras and Axe and all of them. Uh, I usually like players after I've beaten them. I like them very much. Uh. <laughs> but before that, there's yeah. always nervousness and you respect the player. Whether it's the first round or the final, it doesn't matter. Uh, you set the benchmark for German tennis. You were the first to win Wimbledon. Then came along Steffi Graf and she raised the bar even higher. But after both of you, only Angelique Kerber managed to win a couple of Grand Slams in 2016. Uh, what do you think was the reason for that? Because one would have expected with you showing the way, usually when the pioneer shows and leads the way, then everyone just tends to follow. But after you and Steffi Graf, and, and she actually really dominated women's tennis as well, yeah. the, the, the supply line didn't come through. Well, we've had another Wimbledon champion called Michael Stig, obviously. Yeah, but your time. And we've had, you know, a Tommy Haas that reached number two in the world. We had a Nicola Kiefer, number four in the world. So we've had um, great tennis players. We didn't have another superstar, mm -hmm. if you want to, if you want to call it. And I think it goes in waves. Uh, you know, on the women's side, uh, uh, it was you know more than 15 years, over 20 years until. Uh, Angelique Kerber became a superstar on the women's side, and it's for whatever reason, federation, coaching, uh, you know, football became very popular in Germany. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be tennis number one sport; it was fo football. Uh, there we were world champions. So I think um, tennis is on on the up in Germany. Uh, it's become a lot more popular. We have a lot more good players than we've had five years ago, mm -hmm. so that's positive. It's interesting you say that. That's my next question because you've taken up a role with uh, German tennis as well, and some great talent coming through. I mean, a lot of people are talking very highly of uh, Alexander Zverev. Yeah, no, I'm. They uh, named me the head of mm -hmm. men's tennis in Germany uh, since last September. So I'm very honored that they have so much faith in my ability, and then. You know, we have you know, the likes of Sasha Zverev and, and others that are young and are up and coming. They like to represent the country in the Davis Cup, which is great. They want to play the Olympic Games. Uh, that, that's great for Germany. And, and you know, I'm, I'm trying the best I can to help him, to help the coaches just do better themselves. Uh, is it about time that Zverev is going to come through right to the top? Because we're all right now swept up in the euphoria of Federer becoming number one. But let's face it, he's 36. Yeah. He can't go on. And also his rivals are either aging or they have injuries. So you think that Zverev now is at that level where he can challenge for the top spot? Uh, I think rightly so. We're all, we're all engaged in the, the match of Roger Federer reaching number one and, and you know, him winning uh, Shrine Open. But naturally, uh, the next one will come and, and I would very much include Sasha Zverev in the group. You have a few others, 20, 21 year olds, so that's just putting himself in a position to be the next superstars. I think it's a question of time. Ultimately, it will come. But the 2021s you mentioned have a few temperament issues, but there's, there's talent and, and everyone is talented. It's about getting it together. Yeah, I, I don't mind uh, seeing players temperamental on the court. I mean, who would uh, forget the antiques of Jimmy Connors, John, uh, McEnroe. John McEnroe and others? I um, you know, I was temperamental. I think it's, it's, it's part of a personality and a character. So there's nothing wrong with it, um, but it's called. Uh, let's say it's more maturity. It's more, more understanding who you are and making the most of your abilities. I think that's the difference. But is that why Federer is what he is? A lot of people like Federer because of the class, and he's he's much more calm and composed. It's all part of the aura that makes everyone like Federer. I don't know. Um, I have to ask uh, millions of fans. He has. I think ultimately, people like winners, mm. and he's won everything. Uh, uh, you know. I call him the best of all time. Uh, also, over over 15 years, you know, everybody can have a good year, two years, but he's done it now over 15 years. And the long break he has between 2012 and 2017, again winning a Grand Slam, I think that that creates a lot of respect and admiration. The way he plays, mm. you know, very um, cl classic technique, the back and slice. He comes to the net, he plays an all-court game. Uh, it's beautiful. On the other hand, you have a lot of Nadal fans. Yeah because of his passion on the court and the way he looks and topspin and everything. So you have different characters, so it's kind of different strokes for different folks. Um, every, every generation has that and I think it's important. I love that, different strokes for different folks. I'll remember that, I'll tell my friends, Boris Becker told me that. But uh, the way Federer is going, do you see him dominating till the next Olympics? So now it's just about him enjoying his tennis and he's taking whatever result comes his way. I don't think you can, as a 36-year-old, too much plan into the future. I think his future is now. Uh, uh, he's winning. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't see 
I don't see anybody yet um, from the 20, 21 year olds that can dominate that he does or Rafa Nadal. Mm -hmm. I think for the moment I find these two top players dominating even this year, meaning maybe another French for Nadal, maybe another Wimbledon for Federer. I think that's very possible. On the other side, that will eventually stop. Yeah. Uh, I think the question is when. Uh, and also with Federer, I think when you look back at Federer's history and all his wins and all, barring that injury break Boris he took in 2016, he's not had major layoffs. And now you're seeing the others injured as well. Perhaps that's also one of the reasons why he's had this great career because of that no injury except that one brief period. And that injury has helped him. He's come back hungry. Um, I think um, the, the key is always having your right schedule. Mm. You know, you can't play every week. You can't play every month. You cannot be up for every match you're playing. And I think Ferva, even Nadal, they were able to pace themselves. What is their favorite surface? What is their favorite time of the year? And that's when they excel, but then they take off. They take a break regardless how much money you throw at them. And I think that's important for the young players to remember is that ultimately you need a break uh, because if you're in there for a long run, you, 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 you can't change the money tomorrow. Yes, and it's interesting you say that because I was actually looking at the records and, and you get a feeling when Federer was very dominant 2003, 2008, that period, a lot of players like Djokovic, Rafa, they tried catching up when Federer was at his dominant best. And perhaps that's taken a toll now. You're seeing them breaking down, they're injured. They spent so much energy catching up with him at, at, that, at a young age when he was much more ahead of them that now the body is starting to take its toll. Well, tennis is a very physical sport. Uh, you know, eventually, you do get injured. Uh, and I think with Murray and Djokovic, I also thought they were mentally a bit tired. They need a bit of time off. Uh, I, I don't wish an injury in anybody, but uh, um, you know, especially with Murray with the hip, um, that was a serious injury. Now Novak had the elbow problem. I think he had had it done. Now I think he's coming back to to his, his full circle. So that's good. But each player, you can't play 15 years straight. You have to take it easy. Sometimes you start a family. Eventually, you want to take care of your wife and kids. So that all plays in the equation of how many tournaments you want to play every year. Uh, you know, some time back we were talking about Martina Navratilova. Now everyone seems to suggest and say that Federer's the best player of all time. But when you look at that, then you look at someone like a Martina, who also won a Grand Slam at the age of 50. She won incredible. She won nine Wimbledon titles as well. So when you look at the greatest of all time, you also perhaps have to factor in the uh, women's players, or should we just say that the, the greatest men's player, the greatest women's player? I, I, I'd rather see it that way because um, you can't compare the sports. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I call Raja the greatest male player of all time uh, uh, and Martina certainly up there with the greatest female players of all time. Being German, I have to mention Steffi, Steffi Graf. Graf. Of course, you have to mention Serena Williams, Billie Jean King, Margaret Court. Mm -hmm. You know, where, where do you stop? So, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's good to have these legends around and still involved in the game and talking about the game and giving the youngsters advice because, uh, uh, you know, they know the game better than, than most other people. Uh, you know, you spoke about uh, Novak Djokovic. I'll just bring you up because you work closely with him as well once upon a time. Uh, do you think that Novak, when he sits back now, he's injured, he's getting fit now, he looks back at that period when he was a very dominant number one and looks back at his Grand Slam titles and thinks, maybe I should have added a few more because uh, a few titles there went away and, and that gap between him and Nadal right now is is still pretty significant, 4 or 5, uh, 4 yeah, 4. Yeah. But he lost some finals, which perhaps on form he should not have. Well, when you look back, you're always smarter. You always regret the things that he didn't do. Uh, in the three years I worked with him, he won six majors. He won four in a row, I think, so that's good. But the reason I, I came in and I was, I was called to advice because he didn't win for a couple of years and yes. he was 25 and 24. He could have won more, but could have, should have and would have. You're always smarter. I think now, he realizes that at 30 years of age, you know, he's still young enough to add another couple of Grand Slams to his collection because, you know, he's a competitor. He sees that Nadal is ahead, he sees that Federer is ahead and he wants to come back into the winner's circle. And, uh, and do you think that this break is going to see a really recharged, rejuvenated Djokovic 2.0? Because when you see him on the court, that passion and you look into his eyes, initially, you know, he was someone who, who you know, tried to get the crowd on his side, had the few antics, but the, the new Novak you see when he was number one, focus. That is what you see even when the Australian Open he came back, that focus was there in his eyes. No, I think he'll, he'll always be the competitor. He's always been the one that, that 
uh, you know, makes you earn every point that, that, that you win. And, and you know, you can, he, he's, he's, a, he's a warrior on the court, and I think that's always going to be the case. The question is, is he physically fit enough? How is his game overall? Uh, I think uh, you know he's teamed up with Agassi and Stepanek. I think that's the right team around him to bring to him to his very best. You know, uh, just as I wind up, uh, we are here because of uh, the Loris Academy. You're an Academy member. And as you told me, you were the first one of the founder members of this Academy. And I was speaking to Sir Steve Redgrave uh, yesterday and he was saying that, and even Ed Moses, that when they set this up, they didn't know where it was going. But over the years, you'll have managed uh, a lot of good work. Well, we are, we are a little bit proud of, of uh, the fact that we're 18 years old, or 20 means 18. Uh, the very first year was uh, the year 2000 when uh, um, you know, the Laura Sports Academy was founded with the very first uh, Laura Sports Award. Uh, our founding father was Mr. Nelson Mandela, so you can imagine how honored we were uh, sharing a room with him. Uh, and uh, we've gone a long way. We have 130 projects now. Uh, we're reaching millions of kids uh, where we use sport as a tool for social change. You can be involved in sport and, and, and better, better your lives. And we raised millions of dollars and, and continue to do so. Uh, uh, and so we are a little bit proud of, of, of giving back to a sport that's giving us everything. Yeah. And what I like is that usually players have their foundations, but everyone here is on the platform. About 65 of you, then they're the ambassadors. It's virtually the who's who of world sport all coming together. That's a, a section of voice you can't ignore anywhere across the world. Very much so. I think the winners, uh, uh, um, when, they, when they lift the, the lorries into the air, they call it the Oscar of sports. Mm -hmm. And that's the, uh, the biggest compliment we, you know, we get. But uh, more importantly, it's the Sport of Good Foundation where we actually go to India, you know, we go to America, we go to Germany, we go to Africa and, and use the funds that we're creating to to uh, you know, facilitate uh, children, uh, to involve them into sports, you know, to buy them the facilities and all that. Uh, because it's, that's where we are from. You know, tennis gave me everything that I am today and I haven't forgotten. But nice to see you so positive because you, you have been uh, uh, undergoing a few personal problems as well. But uh, champions don't quit. So is that the mantra you're following? You're going to bounce back? You know, um, uh, who said uh, that life was easy? You know, I mean, uh, I've won a few Wimbledon titles and I've lost a few finals. It's just uh, part of the whole package. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy where I am. I'm happy to be Monte Carlo and I'm looking very much to the future. Live life by the day. Boris Becker, thank you so much. Uh, great conversation. Really had some good time because, uh, as I said some time back, I used to watch your finals. Can't believe sitting next to you. Thank you. Thank you, Boris. Thank you very thank much. You.